Uh, when she granted the pardon of innocence uh, to the woman to tell you. I think I'm supposed to take a couple, a few questions from the audience. Oh, before you do that, <laughs> we, we have a treat in that um, at the General Senate in a couple of weeks, the women contend will be honored once again. And uh, through the collaboration with Joffrey Black and the Office of Communication, we are going to premiere the clip that they're going to use at General Senate to honor you. And Skip, why don't you roll? The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The political prisoners called the Wimington Ten have taken every one of those steps in their journey for vindication. Now, after nearly three long decades, hundreds of hours in jail time, and over a million dollars in defense funds, the Wimington Ten finally got justice. The United Church of Christ stood by them every step of the way. And after years of protests, prayers, and appeals, the members of the Wimington Ten received pardons of innocence. Gregory Congregational United Church of Christ in Wilmington was the site of the celebration. But history was made in the North Carolina State House when Governor Beverly Perdue officially signed the pardons, saying justice demands that this stain finally be removed. I'm proud that we were able to do whatever we could do little or large as it was, to be supportive of this, this, this final carriage of justice. One of the longest and most controversial civil rights cases in history began back in the 1970s, when racial tensions came to a boil in Wilmington, North Carolina. After a week of violence, Ben Chavis from the UCC's Commission for Racial Justice Along with students Connie Tyndale, Marvin Patrick, Wayne Moore, Reginald Epps, Jerry Jacobs, James McCoy, Willie Vereen, William Wright Jr., and Ann Shepard, were unjustly accused of firebombing a store. After a racially tainted trial, the Wilmington Ten was found guilty. The United Church of Christ and its Commission for Racial Justice, led by the Reverend Charles E. Cobb, launched a nationwide campaign to secure freedom for the political prisoners. Through executive council meetings and general senate gatherings, over one million dollars was raised for their defense. Eventually, the Wilmington Ten were released from prison, but not pardoned. I remember all the times we met in the executive council dealing with that and how to fund and help with their bail. Where would that money come from? Well, these were difficult, painful, tense times. And the church was caught in it. The, the church had never known a finer hour than it knew in those 10 years that we struggled to free and vindicate the woman in the tent. The Reverend Avery Post was president of the United Church of Christ from 1977 to 1989. He persistently continued the campaign to gain freedom for the Wilmington Ten. The UCC, uh, pursuing justice, went at it hard with legal assistance, with presence in the courts, prison visits, advocacy, demonstrations. But history itself will record this moment as groundbreaking. When Governor Purdue partnered the Wilmington Ten, it was not only a victory for the surviving political prisoners, but a major victory for the United Church of Christ, who worked so tirelessly for justice. I think that it's an encouragement in the end uh, for us to uh, continue to be the kind of church that we are. The pardons end a long, rocky journey for the Wilmington Ten and the United Church of Christ. But today, there are many more steps to go to support others who are still sacrificing, suffering, and struggling in their quest for fairness. The United Church of Christ will continue praying, fighting, and speaking out until justice is reached for everyone.
Joan Prinsler from Grace United and Frederick, Maryland. Glad to have you here. The question I have is how long were they in jail? Because I don't know. There are various times. Um, we were first arrested in 1972. And we spent maybe half of 1972, six months in 1972, uh, before the trial. And then the, we spent another four months. So I would say maybe eight months out of 1972. Then we would, uh, after our convictions, we had to get another bail. Uh, which was around $500,000. Um, and the General Senate in St. Louis in 1973 uh, voted to put $450,000. We had gotten fifty, dollars so we needed four hundred fifty dollars more. And we got out on bail again. Uh, then our appeals went through the North Carolina Appellate Courts, North Carolina Supreme Court, four Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In January of 1976, the United States Supreme Court denied our written assessor order. It means we, we petitioned to be heard. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear us. So that means we have to start actively serving sentences again. So all of 1976, we were in prison, 77, 78, uh, through most of 1979. Uh, I, had, I spent the longest time, almost five years. The others spent uh, three to four years. <coughs> because I know you all had a long day. But I wanted each of our distinguished guests here to sort of reflect on in closing. What are the last results of the movie to 10? Was it worth it? I know both of you made a lot of sacrifices over the years to uh, be involved in this case. And so what's it worth it and what are the lessons that we've learned from this case? Well, I think the, 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 the most important lesson uh, to me is that uh, a church can make a difference. Uh, a church that is committed to justice can see uh, justice achieved. Uh, having said that, I'm well aware that once achieved, it's not over because it becomes a continual struggle to be able to maintain that, and that's the kind of thing that we see in North Carolina today. The issues raised in the Wilmington 10 case, dealing with prosecutorial misconduct, dealing with discrimination in jury selections, dealing with judicial misconduct, all of the legal issues, uh, the hiding of the evidence and the refusal to turn over evidence that would have helped uh, the defense present uh, his case appropriately uh, in court are still present in, uh, in North Carolina and in other states. And that is one of the continuing issues that we deal with in North Carolina. I, 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 I do appellate work, appellate criminal work all the time, and these same issues come up time and time and time again. So I think that the commitment that you made uh, to get involved in this, uh, in this fight uh, for justice led us to the will to contend in the 40 year struggle to vindicate uh, them. But the struggle for justice is larger than just them. And you make a, an important contribution when you put your voice on the line such that other churches and other individuals will see that someone is standing up, therefore I need to stand up and make the same type of witness uh, that, uh, that they've made. And for that, I thank the United Church of Christ for all that it has done, all that it is now doing, and all that it will do in the future. Thank you. Uh, attorney and professor, John is very modest. The truth is, he's one of the hardest working attorneys I'm now a law professor uh, at North Carolina Central University. As colleagues, Irv, Elsie, myself, the Reverend Bill Land, the Reverend Dr. Charles Carr assembled a team of young people 
back at that time, <laughs> who were eager and energetic, excited. You have to understand, our world was changing in the 1960s. It was a time of change. But it was also a time of war. You know, the, the Vietnam War uh, polarized uh, many communities. And as the United Church Press also at the time became a peace church. So the legacy of struggle, uh, I think, also, uh, I'm so proud of. I, I think the Wilmington 10 is a badge of honor, not just for the 10 of us and our families, but for the church at large. And one good thing about what the United Church of Christ stood, once it stood as a denomination, the National Council of Churches later stood with the United Church of Christ, and then the World Council of Churches also stood uh, with the United Church of Christ on this issue. So the whole thing of solidarity is very important. And I think uh, diversity is also very important. We are a diverse church. And I think that's what gives it its strength, uh, that we don't always have to agree on all the issues uh, unanimously, but when the church does resolve the stance of the church for freedom, justice, and equality, it's important for us all to stand together. I do want to just call the names of the four deceased members of the, of the uh, Wilmington 10, because unfortunately they did not live to see the pardon of innocence. And when the governor, with the stroke of the pen, issued the pardon of innocence, I just want to say for Jerry Jacobs, for Joseph Wright, for Ann Shepard Turner, and for Connie Tindall. And Connie was at one of the rallies about nine months before he died, uh, when we were uh, re renewing this plea to Governor Purdue. A month or so ago, I was on a panel with Governor Purdue. I had a chance to thank her personally. You have to understand that it was a courageous move for the first female governor of North Carolina, Southern governor, and I don't, I don't think she'll mind me telling you, she received death threats because of issuing a pardon of innocence to the Wilmington 10. So in 2013, as Irv has said, we not only must be vigilant, but we must be forthright. We should continue to push for equal education for all of God's children. We have to stand uh, for what is right in the world in which we live, which is changing. And I think that the challenges of the past uh, sometimes may be greater today or even less today. But the point is, we should always uh, renew our faith in ways that make a difference in the lives of people in real time. I'm so thankful, again, to all of you. And all of our families are, are very thankful. Uh, the children of the women's intent, which we have not talked about, were impacted. It was just not us locked up in prison. Uh, those of us who had children and loved ones were all also very uh, severely impacted. So this is a time of celebration. It's a time of healing. But I would close as a time of reaffirmation that we practice our faith. We don't only preach our faith, we practice our faith in ways that make the difference in the lives of all of God's people. Thank you, United Church of Christ. did not see that this was going to be a victory. But those of you who were around back in 71 when this first started, you got a chance to see where your faith took you, where the church's support, where the money of the church took us. 
And now we have a victory that we can celebrate and move on to the next struggle to be conquered. Thank you very much. comes, they get gifts. And usually the president presents these, but I'm taking liberties and presenting them. Because it also affords me the opportunity to go behind you and to present to each of you, maybe, say, pardon our justice. <laughs> but instead, it says, thank you. Dr. Irving L. Joyner, Wilmington 10, free at last. <laughs> and guess what? Thank you, Dr. Scott. Wilmington 10, free at last. And of course, there's a third one. Dr. Benjamin Chase. And then our board of directors, when they heard that this was coming together, this opportunity, authorized the following proclamation. And our new moderator, Alex Fischio, is principally responsible for the authorship. The Central Atlantic Conference, United Church of Christ, Wilmington 10 Proclamation. Whereas the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ, UCC, is called to be a prophetic church that acts in word and deed against injustice anywhere and stands in solidarity with its victims everywhere. And whereas in 1971, 10 young civil rights activists, led by Benjamin Chavis, a leader of the UCC's Commission for Racial Justice, were illegally tried, unjustly convicted, and harshly sentenced, while nonviolently working for social justice and racial harmony in Wilmington, North Carolina. And whereas those individuals collectively known as the Wilmington 10, have now been declared fully pardoned and exonerated and may rightfully seek to be compensated by the state for their incarcerations. Whereas, members of the Wilmington 10 have refused to seek revenge or wallow in self-pity despite this extraordinary injustice, but have responded creatively and constructively by establishing the Wilmington 10 Foundation for Social Justice whose primary mission is founded on behalf of the dignity of all people, and whose primary goal is to provide a vehicle for education, rehabilitation, and training to aid in the healing of wounds inflicted during the many battles against injustice. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by this gathered assembly here, from every hill and mole hill, from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city that the vindication of the Wilmington 10 witnesses to the great fact that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes. And that insofar as its members are now truly free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty free at last, this day in June shall hereafter be known and celebrated throughout the Central Atlantic Conference as the Wilmington 10 did. <laughs> Signed by me.
heard that we were going to do this tonight, someone stepped forward and said, I'll pay for the reception, or help pay for the reception. And so there is a reception in their honor over at the hotel, probably on the patio, or if not, it'll be inside in the uh, banquet room around back. Uh, and we are, you are all invited to the party so that you can meet and greet them personally. Um, and we thought we would close out our evening by inviting Bradley Thomas, our president, to lead us in singing Amazing Grace.